That's right. This is Lessons in Leadership, the show that you count on to give the most practical, relevant, best leadership advice. From Mary Gamba, the co-anchor and executive producer, and myself, Steve Adubato. Not that we're promoting, but this oh, why is not? The, why not? This is the Bible of leadership. I know, is that blasphemous? It is not. No, it's not. And if you want to find more out more information and how to get that book, you can go to stand-deliver.com, which is our website. And the good news is we have a lot of free resources up there as well. Free? Free. If it's free, it's for me. We've got free articles on everything, communication, leadership, leading meetings, negotiation, persuasion, you name it, it's there. And also the new book Mary and I are co-authoring. Well, I'm authoring it and she's offering her snipey feedback in every chapter. Yeah, how, how, how good is that going? Steve, let's come on, let's be fully transparent right now. We started with two pilot chapters and I saw your uh, scribble all over my comments. So I said, nope, we're not writing this book together. I'll add my input, but I'm not adding full paragraphs. <laughs> great, let's all, listen, it'll be a great book. There'll be a big picture of me airbrushed, you know, no lines, no nothing. And a little shot of Mary with Mary. On the Gamble. back, on the inside back cover yes. will be me. Hey, by the way, we're going to bring our good friend Jason Fury, who's a, one of the, the head golf pro over at uh, Forest Hill uh, Field Club, a great golf course that I've been a part of for a lot of years. Also on the back end, the CEO of Hackensack Meridian Health, Bob Garrett. Mary, real quick, our sponsors include... Uh, our sponsors, they are so generous. We're so lucky to have them. We have Valley Bank. We have the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, Seton Hall University, and the Seton Hall uh, Bucino Leadership Institute, the New Jersey Sharing Network, and Prager Metis. All good stuff. And the platforms, we just added iHeartRadio and Audible, right? I am so excited about that. Nicole on our team, thank you so much for your help making that happen. Nicole so Smart, Radio. she's the best. She is so great. And then you can also find us on Google Podcasts, Apple Play, R-O-I-N-J, NJ.com. And then we also would love to thank our promotional partners over at CIANJ and Commerce Magazine, as well as NJBIA and New Jersey Business Magazine. So we just have so many great partners and it's all about building relationships. Let's introduce this guy. He's Jason Fiore, uh, PGA Professional Golf Association, Director of Golf. Forest Hill Field Club, New Jersey Golf PGA Board of Directors. Good to see you, my friend. Steve, Mary, thank you so much for having me. Really excited about this. You got it. By the way, um, I have this philosophy. That one of my favorite books is by Bob Bertella. Golf is not a game of perfect. And if golf is not a game about perfect and leadership is never perfect, well, then what are we striving for if not perfection? Is it excellence? Excellence is a great way to start at just the best of what you can possibly do. I mean, obviously with the game of golf is, is just like, it's almost like a microcosm of life. You know, the more effort, and the more time you put into it, the better off you're going to be. Yeah. And by the way, the other thing about Forest Hill, and I've been a member there for many, many years and the evolution of the, the, the club has changed dramatically. Talk about the innovations that have been going on. It was great before what's changed and why. So it's been uh, it's been pretty incredible the the ride the last couple of years. So we have a new owner uh, as of 2019 around Thanksgiving time or so, and uh, Forest Hill has always been an incredible property with a Tillinghast design, an incredible golf course. Um, Tillinghast, great golf designer. Is it? Is yeah, it? E. W. Tillinghast. What's the year? The What's the year? Uh, 1926 is when he redesigned the club or the, the golf course. Uh, the club was founded in 1896. The original property was at Branch Brook Park in Newark. Uh, but yeah, Steve, you're absolutely right. A.W. Tilling has one of the best golf course architects of all time. So he's had the bones here. It's always been a great golf course. Uh, in addition to that, I think, and I think that you would probably agree, the, be the best assets always been the people here. Our members are just phenomenal people. They, you know, they're welcoming. You show up on a Saturday morning, not have a game, and you can find a game very easily just because everyone's so friendly here. Uh, but as far as the innovations and, and the renovations now taking place, uh, like I said, we have got a new owner, uh, Rob Marziato, at the end of 2019, took over um, uh, ownership of the property. We redesigned the entire first floor of the clubhouse last year, totally state-of-the-art from the locker rooms to the card room to the grill room to even a nursery now for daycare services. Mm. Uh, and now we're undergoing a pretty incredible golf course renovation as well. Um, Tom Kite, and uh, the U.S. Open champion. And Billy Fuller, who was the superintendent at Augusta National, pretty good golf course. Not uh, bad. Not bad. It's okay. Yeah, I think they hold a tournament there once a year, I think. I'm not sure. Yep. Um, they're undergoing the uh, architect, um, the architecture for the new redesign. And 
we're super excited about it. We're, um, we're adding bunkers, redesigning all of the bunkers on the golf course, uh, redoing all the tee boxes, changing a few holes next year for phase two. So we're super excited. So, so uh, before Mary jumps in, who is not a big golf fan, by the way, your son plays golf, right, Mary? Yeah, both of my boys play golf, oh. and I am really good at driving a golf cart. I just think they're so much fun. I said, in my retirement, I need to be at a community that has a golf cart. I think they're so fun, but I, okay. I am not not even putt-putt. I'm just not a good golfer. Putt-putt? I don't even know what to do with that. Mini golf. Uh, we don't have a mini miniature golf course at Forest Hill. But, Jason, let me ask you this. The club already had a challenging course. The club had good things going on. Rob comes in as the owner, and the team – innovates. Now, here's the thing we often say. We say the status quo is not an option. Now, some people push back and go, but what happens if you're doing really well already? My argument is, well, if you're not innovating and progressing and improving, you're going backwards, you say? I would agree, especially uh, in an industry as competitive as ours. I mean, you can look from Westchester to Philadelphia, and you have probably the best stretch of private golf courses and golf courses that 200-mile stretches anywhere in the world maybe outside of Scotland, but um, there's so many competitors that we have in our area that you're absolutely right, Steve, that's a great point. If you're not improving and growing as a club, you're going backwards. And I feel like that under Rob's leadership in the past few years, not only the resources that he's uh, invested in the club, but also just the, the time and the energy and the thoughtfulness, uh, we're definitely taking the next step forward. Mary, let's talk a little bit about COVID. Jump in because that's, that's affected every industry, all of us, including the golf world. Go ahead, Mary. Sure. So, uh, yeah. So, Jason, tell us a little bit. So when COVID hit uh, over 14 months ago now, and by the time this airs, it'll even be longer. What did you do to innovate? Right. Like when it first happened, everything was shut down and many businesses closed. Talk a little bit about what Forest Hill did and what your creativity and uh, innovation. Talk about that. Yeah. So uh, we weren't insulated, obviously, to the pandemic back on March 21st. I believe it was last year. Governor Murphy issued the stay-at-home order, um, obviously shut down all businesses, including ours. Um, I know it's cliche, but there's a lot of uncertainty at that point. We weren't sure when we we're going to open back up. And uh, we definitely did some things to, I guess, adapt and 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 kind of mold into what the, the current future or the, the future was going to be. So one thing that I always wanted to do that this really kind of sped the process for was open up an online retail store for the golf shop. So Obviously, everything's going, you know, uh, you know, e-commerce now with Amazon and, and Google, and that's kind of the future. And I always kind of had wanted to do that, uh, but this just kind of expedited the process. So we, um, we set up a, a, a Shopify website. We put all of our inventory online. We offered um, curbside uh, pickup for all of our golf shop merchandise. Uh, so that was really, really uh, important for just to have some sort of uh, revenue during that that month or five weeks where we were totally shut down. And also we offered, uh, once it was obviously allowed by the state, um, to go service for the food and beverage side at the club. And uh, yeah, that, that six-week stretch or so was, was pretty challenging for sure. And protecting people, not easy. Not easy at all. Not nope. easy at all. And, and, you know, employees, because we have such a great team at Forest Hill. I mean, Jason leads a great team. And also Mike Spenley, the starter there, just, I mean, first-class guy and everyone in the back room, they're just terrific people. But how the heck, a lot of leadership is keeping people motivated and focused, but during a time of such uncertainty, A, how to even keep them there and then keep them there ready to give their best when things not get back to normal, but we, we can start resuming things. How do, how do you do that? That's a great question, Steve. And I can say that uh, during that five or six week period between say, you know, March 21st, 23rd, whenever it was through to, you know, May 1st or 2nd, when we finally got of the 2020 of 2020. of 2020. Yes. When we finally got the go ahead to actually open up golf in some capacity. And we can talk about that later if you'd like. I feel like my staff and I got closer during that period than we ever had before. I mean, whether it just be, you know, we had weekly Zoom meetings and kind of just status updates and just getting the information out to our staff, you know, whatever we could possibly uh, pass along was important, but also just, you know, my, my assistants last year, Chris and Sean and Brian and Mike Spelling, as you said, is a huge asset of Forest Hill uh, and the backroom staff as well with, you know, Matt and Brandon and, and Sora and the entire crew, just calling them on a daily basis, just checking in, how are you doing? How's your family doing? And just taking, you know, just making sure that the general thoughtfulness as far as everyone's well-being 
really kind of had a, uh, an unintended you know, benefit on the back end where like, all right, well, you know, we're all together in this now, like we're a family in this versus just being employees, we're people first. Mm-hmm. And I really feel like when everyone did come back to work, because unfortunately we did have layoffs, uh, everyone was just that much closer and stronger and wanted to work that much more, you know, I guess harder. Mary, it's so interesting. The pandemic on some level brought people in certain situations closer together. Even look, I've never looked at it that way. Yeah, I I think it really did. And it also, as I always say, when tough situations come along, it lets you know who your friends are. And that's also the same at work, even though it may not be quote unquote friends, it really lets you know who you can count on in tough times. Mary, you remember when we were writing lessons in leadership, I talked about golf experiences. We were talking about, I believe in the chapter you can't lead others until you learn to lead yourself. You're smiling. Mary, stop. Get that smile well, off. I, I was going <laughs> to ask you about managing your emotions. And I think this story had to do with you taking a golf club, possibly breaking it and throwing it into the woods, something <laughs> along those lines. No. Well, well my, my playing partners, Nikki Matarazzo and Andy Duke and Dennis Pucci and Joe Solano, they, these, they're the greatest guys. But back at a previous time, about 10 years ago, Jason, you may not have realized that my temperament and demeanor was not always as calm as it is right now. And it manifests itself on the golf course. What would you say the correlation is between comportment, demeanor, staying calm in golf, and of course in leadership? Please share. Yeah, I would say that's an excellent analogy. Um, You can look at a guy like, you know, the best golfers in the world right now. And, And part of the way that they can Exactly. They can make does that. Does Dustin Johnson have a pulse? I don't think he does. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I'm, if it is, it's about, you know, uh, 80 over 40. But um, right. yeah, it, it's just a guy like Jordan Spieth, you know, back when he was winning all the all the tournaments or Brooks Kepka. Um, you just, you don't see the emotion. That, that's, that's how they can make a six, seven foot putt. They can focus in on it. Uh, and I believe that leadership, you need to be, have that same consistency as well. Uh, so that your team and your staff can always depend on you. Clearly, those past incidents are behind us, and I've been nothing but an appropriate golfer slash gentleman on the course. No question about it. But the only thing that I am a little bit worried about, Steve, I am yes. worried about. You haven't come for a lesson in a while. I'm worried about the handicap. Um, there it is. Just, can I just say this? Of course. I enjoy the Jersey Shore. <laughs> I enjoy the beaches at the Jersey Shore. And when you go to Forest Hill, you find yourself in a lot of sand traps, so I feel very much at home. How does that work for you, Jason? You're absolutely right. I anticipate a lot of bunker lessons this year for the yes, entire right. members. The problem is not getting into them. The problem is getting out of them. Yes. Okay. Yes. Jason Fury from uh, a Forest Hill Field Club, a terrific place with terrific golfers and a great course. Thanks to Rob and everyone there doing a great job. Mary, I'm telling you, you're coming for a lesson. I, I'm in. Hey, I never said I wouldn't play. I just said I have played and I'm not that good at it. Don't worry about it come with us. Hey, Mary, Steve, Jason, Lessons in Leadership. We'll be right back talking golf. No, talking leadership. (laughs) This edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, is brought to you by Valley Bank, the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, New Jersey Sharing Network, Prager Metis, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. This is the Seton Hall story, one that comes to life every day on our campus. This is the place where great minds discover, innovate, collaborate, and find their true calling. This is the place where passion has a purpose, where learning inspires leading. The bonds we make, the values we teach, inspire our community to take heart and take action. This is Seton Hall University. This is what great minds can do. Welcome back to uh, the greatest show on the air. Any visual media platform about leadership, lessons in leadership, Steve Adubato and Mary Gamble. 
Hey, can I correct you on something? I love being corrected by you, Steve. I'm ready. I, yeah. You taught okay. me well. I'm good at taking feedback, so go right ahead. 21 years together, a lot of feedback back and forth. The incident that I wrote about in the book, about when I happened to break a club, it wasn't my club, it was someone else's because I thought it was my driver, it was his. <laughs> it's true. That's true. But here's the thing. I never threw the club into the woods. Oh, I, mean, I you, embellished you the story. No, no, you embellished to make the story better, but I would never throw a golf club anywhere. I, I, I felt bad. <laughs> as, if, as if that makes it better. The fact that you uh, not only broke a club, it wasn't yours, I, but it's all okay because you did not litter in the woods at Forest Hill. No, I didn't throw a golf club. I never mind. So have wait, yeah. let me just clarify though. I I seem to recall you once throwing a golf club. That was no, that was a was putter. that a different situation? Come on, that honesty. Was, no, that was a different one. That was a putter, and I missed a three-foot putt to win a tournament. And, and I just took the putter and I was like, oh, and I threw it over my head and it went into the bushes. And it was at Francis Byrne golf course, and then we couldn't find the putter. Yeah. So that is bushes are found in the woods. So I still stand pretty okay. firm in my you recollection. Play, <laughs> you conflated two golf stories, neither one of which I look good in. So thank you very much. Hey, speaking of a guy who plays golf, but has a very calm demeanor, we set up this interview with Bob Garrett. What's the biggest takeaway people should be looking for with uh, Bob Garrett, the CEO of Hackensack Meridian Health? Yeah, definitely. So he talked a lot about really when the pandemic happened, uh, working out issues, problems, obstacles in a more global thought process, meaning take a more holistic approach. You can't, especially in healthcare, you can't just look at one aspect of leadership. He couldn't just look at his own leadership. He had to think about the physicians, the nurses, the people, uh, you know, the security, like all of it at once, taking a holistic approach to leadership, particularly in a pandemic. So I think that was really great about that uh, conversation. Throw to the interview with Bob Garrett, since yeah. you're so busy criticizing me <laughs> and my golf demeanor, why don't you take over? I would love to. So stay tuned right after this. You're going to see a fantastic interview with Bob Garrett, the CEO of Hackensack Meridian Health. Okay. Go to you, Bob you Garrett. Can't, you can't really let me have the last word, though. I realize that. You say no. I'm going to have the last word, no. but then you have the last word. So go no, ahead. We're Steve. not even on the air anymore. Bob Garrett's on. <laughs> You're so bad. We're here with Bob Garrett, who is the uh, CEO of Hackensack Meridian Health. I've said this many times on Lessons in Leadership. We actually run a Physicians Leadership Academy at HMH. And boy, have I met some extraordinary leaders in the physician community. Bob, let me ask you, we're taping this on February 16th. It'll be seen after. I asked you last time you were with us, number one leadership lesson you learned. Fast forward. Would the answer be different than what you said then? Meaning, have you learned any new leadership lessons? Uh, we, we have learned some new leadership lessons, but I would say my number one answer is still the same, and that is in a crisis, communication and transparency are so paramount. And, you know, we communicated every day. We became uh, a, a trusted voice for, uh, for information. There was so, so much misinformation out there, Steve, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic. CDC kept on changing the, um, the rules, the regulations, the guidance, um, and people depended on Hackensack Meridian to put out the appropriate information, the accurate information, and the transparent and an easy way to understand. We would we would communicate to our team members each and every day. We communicate to our board members, uh, to uh, to the community, to our physicians as well. Those communications are still going on, and I have to tell you, the feedback is still very very positive. So we've tried to be as transparent as possible, and as we're rolling out the vaccines, that communication is still very important. There's still a lot of misinformation out there, particularly on the internet. Uh, you know, misinformation about uh, the vaccine being unsafe uh, for certain uh, certain groups of people. It's its just not true. So we've been trying to separate the fact from the fiction. Let me, let me get into the weeds a little bit with you, Bob. You and I talk a lot about communication for about a decade now. We obsess over being the best communicators we can be. So connect for our audience on Lessons in Leadership, and we'll also use this for the uh, Leadership Academy at HMH. Great leadership and effective remote communication skills because yours have evolved in the past year. Mine have evolved. We're hopefully getting better. Bob, talk about the connection. Yeah, you know, I think that's that's so important because, um, you know, obviously communication has uh, has changed uh, significantly. So we we have, I think we have certainly taken advantage of uh, remote video communications. They've, they've been more effective. We've learned what to do, what not to do. 
we've learned, you know, to when you have multiple people speaking and we're educating, you know, a group of uh, group of people that, you know, one speaker at a time and, you know, you mute the rest. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, lessons there to uh, to be learned. But I think the, you know, people are receiving that kind of communication better now, too. So we're, we're more used to it in terms of delivering the message. And people are now used to receiving their information through uh, through remote video, through Zoom and and other types of uh, uh, mediums. So, you know, I, I, I think there's more of a, a general acceptance uh, out there. And, uh, you know, it's been very effective in, in some respects. You know, we can get our message out to, uh, to a greater number of people through uh, through our remote communication. You know, the, the other thing I, I just want to mention, Steve, in terms of lessons sure. learned, uh, you know, from the public health perspective, from the healthcare perspective, you know, it, it is it is so um, apparent to me that the virus has seen no borders. You know, it's a, it's a global problem. And therefore we have to share best practices in a, in a global manner. You know, the idea of, uh, of everybody keeping, you know, best, uh, best healthcare practices, best, um, best in research to themselves. I think those days are, are gonna be over because again, uh, virus has not seen any borders. They don't stop at borders. We should not be stopping at borders in terms of what we've learned. And honestly, early on in the pandemic, we learned from our colleagues in Italy what they what they were experiencing, which did help uh, did help us immensely. We learned from colleagues in China, um, so I I think you know one of the lessons learned here is we got to share information. We got to share information about public health. Got to share information about therapeutics, about research, um, about lessons learned in general. It's really important to share information, and that goes along with the communication and transparency. Real quick before I let you go, a physicians leadership academy, and whether it's physicians, nurses, whatever, but in this case, Physicians Leadership Academy. And I don't want to turn this into a commercial for what we do, or, you know, it doesn't matter whether we do it or anyone else. Why is physician leadership development so important? You know, physician leadership development is incredibly uh, important. Uh, you know, during COVID, we saw the need for, uh, for physician leaders to, uh, to really step up, you know, whether they, their background was infectious disease or general medicine, or if they were uh, scientists, they were researchers, you know, because they, they needed to lead people. They needed uh, people to listen to their message. They needed to be able to communicate. They needed to be able to be effective in, in um, delivering uh, messages. So, you know, Steve, I think more, more so than ever, the Leadership um, uh, Development Institute for Physicians is um, hugely important. And I, I have to tell you, I was so impressed with what I saw during this crisis. We have so many great physician leaders. Many of them have gone sure, through, sure. through that program. And uh, the, the skills that they learn in that program uh, really helped them, I think, get through this pandemic uh, really uh, with flying colors. Well, it's more about the physicians on that team than anything else. Hey, Bob Garrett, thank you for talking leadership, talking COVID and innovation, pivoting, all those things and beyond. Thank you, Bob, all the best. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate you having me. Lessons in Leadership, that was Bob Garrett from Hackensack Meridian Health, Mary Gamba, Steve Adubato, we've got a couple of minutes left. I have some leadership quotes I want to go through, but real quick, this is one of the ones I really like. How about this one, Mary, about emotions? What is it? Learn to use your emotions to think, not to think with your emotions. Why does this trigger something for me? You were talking about this crazy golf stuff and whatever mm -hmm. in the past when I was a different person. I found much better medication since then, but you know what? Um, that was a joke. So Scarlett was telling me the other day that when he was at your house with Elvin and they were setting up, <clears throat> Scarlett, I'm going to put you on the spot. You don't even have a microphone or anything. Scarlett, what were you saying yesterday about Mary when you went over her house, you had to build a new set and everything. What did you say about being in Mary's house is incredible? Why? It was a good vibe. A good vibe. Oh, thank you, Scarlett. Go ahead. And what did you say about Mary? She was amazing. She was cooperative. So uh, she was helping out. Helping out, cooperative. It was really helpful and patient. Helpful and patient. Oh, remind you thank you, Scarlett. Well, well, and the funny thing is, what he didn't add is, it was pretty much after three and a half hours. It was ten thirty on a Friday night. God bless him. God bless his girlfriend. Patience of a saint. And she was uh, there with him. Oh yeah, and and for a while she was in the car, and then I said she has to come in, but she's afraid of dogs. And then we convinced her to come in, and it was totally fine. And it, it's just it goes to show you though, Steve. I mean, in all seriousness, going back to leadership, it truly does take a village. There were a lot of 
issues, challenges, and obstacles. And there were a couple times that I said, that's it, I'm going back up to my other studio. And, and the guys really kept pushing us through. And at the end of the day, and I hate that expression, I can't believe I just said it, but at the end of the day, we have a really great product. I feel we are in a great place. And most importantly, they made it easy for me uh, to be you know, where I am right now in my home studio. So thank you guys so much for all of your help and dedication as well. Hey, Alvin, can you be heard right now? <clears throat> Can Elvin be heard? Can you be seen? Okay. okay come, on. come on in. You can tell we're doing this live. Elvin, let me ask you something. There he is. We've been together over a year now. I know it feels like 10. But listen, I, I'm not in love with the idea of hearing how great Mary is. But let's get this out of the way. You built a new studio here where I am. You built a new studio with Mary. Don't compare the two experiences. But what makes Mary a great leader and a great person? Because to me, you know, they're not disconnected. Well, we'll start with Mary being a great person. She's a great host. She helped us out when we got there. She was very kind, very friendly. Not to say that you're not, you are as well. No, no don't talk about me right now, please. <laughs> but, but Mary was perfect. Anything we needed, she was there to help us, help us out with. So I, I stand by, sir. Look, look, look at him. Uh, stand by, <laughs> sir, I love it. <laughs> You have two minutes left, by the way. But... <laughs> I love the ability to multitask. Hold on, but no. what about her demeanor? That's a big deal. Oh, her demeanor. Mary's always calm. I've, I've never heard Mary raise her voice ever, ever. What's you up won't. with that? Yeah, you won't. It, I, I don't, and Steve, you and I have talked about this a million times. When, when things go wrong, and even if somebody brings me a leaky bag of poop, which we talk about all the time, sure, I, I'm not happy about it, but... It's just a matter of, I find that if, uh, you know, you don't, my husband, Bill, he always says, you don't have to be crazy to be productive. And I'm not saying you're crazy, Steve. But Wait, you I, what are all these, hold on one second. <laughs> what are all these references to me while they're talking well, about it's, you? It's, it's a disclaimer in, fi in fine print with an asterisk. It's, uh, no, but I, I've just found, you know, in life and just how I approach things, uh, literally the other day I was, you know, it was late at night and I turned around and a glass went flying across the room, shattered everywhere in a million pieces. And for a second, I wanted to really freak out. And I said, you want to know what? If that is the worst thing that happens in my day, I went and grabbed the vacuum and said, eh, all right, it's good, you know. And I think that's it. I think it's perspective taking as well. Um, so I think it's just taking things into perspective, right? There's always somebody who has it worse off. There's always somebody that's dealing with much worse stuff than we are. So um, yeah, so that's where that comes from. Mary has taken the quote, learn to use your emotions to think, not to think with your emotions. Yeah. Um, and now we know how great she is and I have no oh, idea. Well, thank you. And I do want to say, Steve, I mean, all kidding aside, and we talked about you throwing golf clubs and what have you. And that was 15 we all have, years ago. We all have our moments, but you have taught me so much about being a confident leader and about getting stuff done. So I thank you for that in all seriousness. So thank you. Uh, listen. I do yoga, Pilates, stretching, meditation. I'm much more chill. And I just want to clarify that those stories, whatever behavior on the golf course, are ancient history. Scarlin, stop laughing. That's the old Steve. This is the We new can Steve. only move forward. Thank you, Elvin, for the everything you've done on the team and telling me I have five seconds left. That is the very peaceful namaste, Mary Gamba, Steve Adubato passionate and fiery as always. Lesson leadership. <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs> this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, is brought to you by Valley Bank, the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, New Jersey Sharing Network, Prager Metis, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, and Seton Hall University showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. This is the Seton Hall story, one that comes to life every day on our campus. This is the place where great minds discover, innovate, collaborate, and find their true calling. 
This is the place where passion has a purpose, where learning inspires leading. The bonds we make, the values we teach, inspire our community to take heart and take action. This is Seton Hall University. This is what great minds can do.